episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to uh, another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest uh, who is helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people. Uh, as we're continuing along our theme uh, of cancer and oncology, uh, we have the honor today of uh, being joined by Dr. Patrizia Patrolini, uh, who is a tenured professor of cell and molecular biology and oncology at Paris Descartes University and head of research team at the French National Institute of Health and Medical Research, INSERM. Uh, Dr. Patrolini studied medicine at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, where she specialized in hematology and oncology. Uh, in 1988, she turned her focus uh, to research in cell and molecular biology and published dozens of research articles and reviews in both national and international scientific journals. Uh, her work ultimately led to the discovery of the isolation by size of tumor cell test, or I. SET or ISET test, uh, which permitted the isolation and characterization of circulating tumor cells, which is a type of cell uh, that is shed into the vasculature bloodstream from a primary tumor, uh, is carried around the body in the blood circulation, and can ultimately extravasate and become parts, seeds basically for the growth of additional tumors known as metastases, which uh, are a major mechanism responsible for the vast majority of cancer-related deaths. Uh, the ISET test also interestingly has application for uh, isolation of fetal cells uh, in circulation in the mother's body for potential use in prenatal diagnoses. Uh, the ISET discovery has led Dr. Paterlini to also found her own company named Rare Cells Diagnostic to further develop this technique. Uh, Dr. Paterlini has received numerous awards and honors over the years, including everything with the best thesis in medicine, the best research in hematology, uh, to a recent European Inventor Award finalist. Uh, she has listed on an inventor and numerous patents as well. Uh, Dr. Patrizia Paterlini, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while today. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here and to talk to you and to the audience about uh, our work. Wonderful, wonderful. Really appreciated. Um, I, typically, you know, as we do, we, we like to start off by handing uh, the, the floor directly to our guests to, to talk about them themselves for a little bit. If you could just take a little time uh, to talk about your background, sort of the early days and when you first developed your interest in, in science and medicine and oncology. And, and as your sort of oncology trip over the years has taken you from uh, bloodborne cancers to, to solid tumors uh, and and, and, and oncogenesis in the liver and, and other organs, and now back to sort of circulating tumor cells. I wonder if you could take us on a little bit of that journey as well as you have de developed throughout the years in this uh, domain. Okay, that, that's a pleasure. Uh, yes, well, uh, I was born in, uh, in a little village close to a town, little town, uh, which is Modena, you know, the town of, uh, maybe is known of uh, Luciano Pavarotti, <laughs> maybe you know him, Absolutely. and Ferrari cars and also uh, balsamic vinegar, that's a small town, but uh, uh, quite uh, well known. And uh, yes, uh, uh, my father was a banker, my, my mother was was a scientist. I have an uh, older sister, three, three years uh, older than me. And um, I have to say, since when I was a child, I was used to play um, as a doctor, uh, saving my, my little friends uh, uh, from death. And uh, yes, I, I also smiled about this. And um, growing up, since I didn't know what to do when uh, someone around me was uh, uh, very ill and, and uh, close to death, I was praying because I didn't know what, what to do. Um, you know, for, for this person. I have to say that I always carried a sort of rebellion to the idea of that, and that still is like this. But this also pushed me to, you know, to, to what I did and to the rest of my life. So I like to, to say that, you know, the best of Italian DNA um, is exemplified in uh, Luciano Pavarotti, you know, because okay. <laughs> it's funny, but uh, um, he, he combines uh, this uh, talent, uh, the, the generosity, uh, joie de vivre, and that at the same time, a very high level skill 
and technicality uh, mixed uh, and, uh, you know, hidden by uh, huge talent. And this is what I found in uh, my dear mentor and maestro, uh, because, of course, uh, I, I chose medical studies and I went to, to the town, the University of Modena, and there I met this uh, huge maestro. Um, Professor Mario Coppo, at that time, he was so well known. He was the, uh, the doctor of the Pope, of Maria Callas, of many presidents in Europe. And uh, he, he really, uh, really made my life different. Why? Because uh, uh, first of all, he was an opatologist, but uh, uh, he was what I call a pan clinician, you know, knowing uh, deeply many specialties. Uh, so being able uh, to really uh, uh, treat and, and take care of uh, the whole human being. And uh, he taught me two things. One is that, uh, you know, you, you really need to um, see patients uh, as a whole. Um, meaning that it's not, not a combination of organs, uh, but it's organs plus mind plus soul and suffering can come from uh, each one of these and uh, affecting the others. And the second uh, thing he told to me is that uh, medicine is the most beautiful work, it's true, uh, because it's a combination of uh, art and science, you know, just like uh, for Pavarotti, you have uh, the technicality and the talent. Uh, and now in medicine, you have uh, science, but also art because uh, you deal with the human beings, uh, with humanity. So um, I, I, I was very much privileged because uh, in the University of Modena, he, he chose three young doctors uh, to be his assistant, and uh, I was one of uh, those. But um, along the line, I, something unexpected uh, happened to me and uh, changed, you know, or, you know, determined uh, what I did after. And this is uh, something that I, I cannot forget. I was, uh, as a young uh, intern uh, during my internship, I was in charge of a ward with six beds. And one day a patient arrived and he was uh, uh, quite young, 35 years old, and he was... Uh, uh, in panic, <laughs> that, that's the word. Uh, very pale, sweating, uh, trembling, and I couldn't understand. And finally, by uh, collecting the uh, medical record, I understood that he was in panic because his father had died three months before of pancreatic cancer, and he was finding in himself the same identical symptoms. Mm. So what... Uh, terrible experience and I, I felt really sympathetic with him and, uh, and of course I was moved. When the, the result of the exams arrived, uh, he had metastasis everywhere of pancreatic cancer. So what happened is that uh, he was asking me all the time, doctor, do I have a cancer? Will I die because of cancer? And I didn't know what to answer. So I, I asked my superiors and they told me, oh, don't take risk, you know, and there, he, he may commit suicide. Just uh, tell him that he has an infection and uh, push him to, to fight. <laughs> so I did it. And uh, one morning, early morning, I arrived into my ward and I found a group of white coats around his bed and uh, got closer, and, and, and then I saw him. He could not speak. He had uh, big eyes open up, looking at me, and uh, those eyes told me, you betrayed me. Mm. 
I could not stand this. I just uh, felt I was becoming crazy, a big pain in my head. I ran away. I threw away my coat. I uh, ran in my car. I drove four kilometers. I went to the north of Italy, the Lake of Garda, where there are uh, waterfalls and you can uh, stay behind the water. And I spent my night there praying God and just uh, saying, I failed. Not only I couldn't cure those patients, but uh, I, I couldn't even relieve his pain. So how bad I am, I don't want to, to be a doctor no more. I am too bad. And <laughs> at the end, um, I said, okay, I come back. But if I come back, I really have to do all what I can for cancer patients. So that's the beginning of, of, of my, the beginning of uh, my my story with cancer, and um, uh, so I became oncologist, hematologist. Uh, I I learned how to treat the patients at best, but then I I realized that uh, you know there is uh, so much unknown in medicine, and um, and so uh, research was the way. And the molecular biology uh, was the way to really understand how cancer uh, develops. So at that point, I decided to go to Paris, to the Pasteur Institute, uh, and to study molecular biology. And uh, at that point, uh, I was very much interested, uh, you know, in, in liver cancer, because uh, cancer is known to be a DNA disease. And so the mystery for, for me at that time was how a virus, because we knew that uh, um, a big proportion of liver cancer are determined by hepatitis B infection mm -hmm. or hepatitis C infection. So I, I thought how a virus can determine cancer if cancer is a DNA related disease. Okay. So, and so that's why I, I spent years to study it. In fact, uh, it was clear that the DNA of the virus can integrate into the DNA of the cells and deregulate genes, which are important for the cell growth and trigger the cancer development. But I was very much frustrated, you know, uh, era because I, 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 I had to to quit the clinical work, so I didn't work because the the, the research work was so uh, demanding, you know, really uh, full time, uh, you know, seven to seven day and, and the full time job, really. And um, I was frustrated because uh, I realized that studying how cancer develop um, is a too long way to the moment when your research can have a, an impact on patients. Because a study, studying how a cancer develops, uh, then you, you can find the molecular mechanism, you can hope to find uh, you know, a mutation or something that you can target with a drug, but the time to validate, the, to, to find the, the good drug, to validate uh, in clinical studies and so on, then you have decades after that. And at the end, you just made something worth for one single, single cancer or maybe a subtype. So I took the problem on another uh, way and uh, I thought, okay, but uh, cancer, um, the different types of cancer, they all kill the patients in the same way. And this was a better approach. Uh, so uh, as everybody knows, uh, cancer uh, kills by creating uh, um, colonies in other organs. Uh, and the colony is created uh, by cells uh, which are spread by the primary tumor, the tumor which has been developed, which has developed the first. And uh, uh, while I was uh, studying uh, this uh, uh, liver cancer uh, mechanism uh, related of carcinogenesis, I, I saw that a new domain appeared and, uh, and I was fascinated. 
it's uh, the domain of circulating tumor cells. Mm -hmm. The story uh, era is that, uh, you know, circulating tumor cells uh, have been uh, seen for the first time in 1869 mm -hmm. um, and described by an Australian doctor, Thomas Ash Ashway, Ashtray. Um, and uh, he, in fact, described a young patient who died because of generalized cancer with nodules, you know, uh, subcutaneous nodules everywhere. And he had the idea to look at the blood. And in the blood, he discovered the same cells that he found into the nodules. And first in the history of medicine, he put forward the hypothesis that those cells are the bridge uh, between the primary tumor and the metastasis. So the seeds mm -hmm. which uh, create the metastasis. The problem uh, was that uh, those cells are so rare that uh, after that time, for decades and uh, yeah, uh, a century, um, nearly, no, more than a century, uh, the scientists could not find them in patients. And since they could not find them in patients, uh, they study uh, circulating tumor cells in animals, you know, especially scientists like uh, uh, Dr. F uh, Fiedler, Do uh, Dr. Liotta in the United States, they used fluorescent tumor cells mm. in mice uh, to uh, study uh, the process of invasion, you know, mm -hmm. which is the process uh, generating uh, metastasis. And it was clear that tumor cells are spread in blood years before the metastasis appear. And that's a very important concept, you know, because when we see a patient, like the patient I described to you, with metastasis everywhere, we think that the cancer has uh, um, developed in a very rapid manner, very violently, uh, abruptly hitting the patient. Is not like this. Um, cancer and metastasis always take years to develop, mm -hmm. many years. And because this process uh, is very inefficient. So you understand that uh, this is really what I was looking for, because this is a window, mm -hmm. a window of, of opportunity where we can act when we find the tumor cells in blood before the metastasis develop. And so we can save the patient by preventing the formation of metastasis. And, and so this is uh, how the story started. And, uh, but of course there were challenges, you know, and the challenge is that uh, uh, two challenges, in fact, uh, big challenges. First of all, I told you these cells are very rare. What does mean rare? Uh, rare means that uh, in, uh, in 10 ml of blood, you know, like uh, the volume of a spoon uh, of liquid, in 10 ml of blood, uh, we have uh, on average 100 million leukocytes, 50 billion leukocytes, mm -hmm. uh, 50 billion erythrocytes, but only one or few tumor cells if they are in blood. So is sort of, uh, you know, finding an individual uh, in the population of seven planet Earth. <laughs> it's quite challenging, you know. Yeah. It's a big, big uh, difference, uh, disproportion. And uh, the second challenge is how do we say uh, without making mistake that there is a tumor cell in blood. This is also important because if we make a mistake, then of course we cannot be effective. Sure. So these are the two challenges. And, um, and you know, uh, what I learned from uh, my maestro, my mentor, uh, was very useful to me, including in my research work. Uh, I tell you why. We started looking for those uh, circulating tumor cells by targeting, by targeting molecules, you know, proteins or transcripts, RNA, uh, which we thought um, uh, are expressed in tumor cells. Uh, 
And then we made a lot of studies and we published that, that there is no proteins, so no antigen, no transcript, which is 100% specific of tumor cells of a given tumor type mm -hmm. and not expressed at all in leukocyte. Yeah. Okay. And we, you, you see, we demonstrated this with the alpha, alpha fetoprotein uh, RNA because alpha fetoprotein is considered a marker of liver tumor mm. expressed by liver cancer cells. And so we targeted the, the transcript and we demonstrated that we could find the transcript in uh, patients after surgery without liver cancer. Mm. So during surgery, uh, liver cells went into the blood and the signal, we had the, all the controls of course, the signal uh, became positive. Demonstrated that also non-tumor cells, they express a low level, the, the RNA of alpha fetoprotein. So we were left with no way how to uh, find those uh, uh, circulating tumor cells. And uh, this is why I, I, I say that the, the teaching of my maestro was useful. I said, no, I don't want to uh, target molecules. I want to target the whole, you know, biological entity. Like for patients, don't, tar don't target the organ, Ta target the whole uh, patient if you want to be a good doctor. Mm -hmm. And so that teaching was important to me. And so I said, okay, I, we have to succeed in extracting the whole cells from the blood. And this will have two advantages. On one side, uh, we will have the cells intact. So there is a science called cytopathology, mm -hmm. where pathologists, they look at the cells under microscope, okay, and they can say, this is a tumor cell, this is not a tumor cell. So that's the first advantage that we can have the cells analyzed by cytopathologists. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the second advantage is that uh, if you succeed in that, uh, keeping those cells intact, then we have the molecules so once that we know that we have tumor cells, we can study and analyze the molecules inside the mutation, the transcripts, mm -hmm. because we have the whole um, circulating tumor cells. Yes, but uh, the problem was how can we extract from blood uh, those cells without losing any one of them because they are so rare. Right. That was the, the challenge. So because I'm a hematologist and, you know, but this is something which is known, blood cells are the smallest cells in the body. So I went to the vision that we should isolate those cells coming from organs, tumor cells. They are larger. Of course, they are larger than blood cells. So it came to my mind that we should try to isolate uh, because of their larger size. So I started interviewing, you know, scientists in blood banks. I went to New York to, long, you know, many laboratories uh, working on blood and asking, uh, what do you think about uh, filtering blood to isolate those cells? They discouraged me uh, very violently. They, they told me no way is not possible because first of all, uh, blood, you can filter blood in a tangent manner. Yes, but in a tangent manner, I cannot isolate rare cells. So I wanted mm -hmm. to filter blood in a vertical manner. In a vertical manner, they told me is impossible. It's impossible because first of all, blood is very much heterogeneous from one patient to another. Uh, so it clothes, you know, it's so different. And, sure. and yeah, that's a big difficulty for what you want to do. Uh, second one, uh, he, 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 again, he, he, you will clog the, the pores of the filter. It cannot work. Um, it's not the same thing as, uh, you know, uh, filtering sand to extract the shells. It's not the same because shells are, are you know, 100 or 200 times larger than right. 
understand. But uh, in this case, uh, tumor cells are twice or three times larger than, uh, than blood cells. So all the small cells, they, 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 they go and, and uh, of course, uh, um, block the pores. But I didn't see any other <laughs> way. So I, I stuck to this idea. And uh, with my collaborators, so we tested more than 800 ways uh, to filter blood. It was, uh, you know, uh, we didn't want to give up. Give up. Right. And we tested, you know, everything, positive, negative filtration, uh, hundreds of uh, types of filter uh, pores, uh, densities, thickness, material, uh, you know. We ended up, uh, luckily, uh, with 30 parameters. And when those parameters are tuned at the right point, it's possible to get out from blood one single tumor cell that we mixed uh, with 10 ml of blood. Mm. And I can tell you that this was uh, really uh, you know, a big joy when, because in, in the laboratory, we culture tumor cells, we make them fluorescent, and then we take just one under microscope, and then we put this single uh, tumor cell in 10 ml of blood. And then we, we apply our system ISET mm -hmm. and, uh, and the first time we, we, we saw that we had the recovery, oh, champagne, you cannot imagine the joy. <laughs> um, now the specification of ISET are really uh, this one to be able uh, to isolate down to one single tumor cell in 10 ml of blood and repeated the test. Uh, they, they found that we can uh, do that in more than 95% of cases. So these are the specification in our EC labeling. And, uh, you know, we have been audited for that. That is uh, unparalleled sensitivity. It's very, very difficult to be, to, to have this, this uh, extreme sensitivity. As I said, the cells are intact. So now we can use uh, the cells to diagnose the presence of tumor cell in blood. And we can use the cells uh, to get out the molecules from the cells and, um, and, uh, uh, and study the molecules inside the cells. Um, that was uh, my, so I, I, I quit, uh, you know, the research to understand how mm -hmm. a cancer develop uh, to follow and, and, and uh, find something that could be able to detect circulating tumor cells at the very beginning of the invasion process. You know, invasion process is a military term, you know, right. and you have those cells, you know, invading the blood, invading uh, the tissues. And uh, the, the game is that we don't want those cells to become able uh, to um, create colonies in the distant organs. Sure. In fact, what we know is really passioning at the beginning, the tumors, they spread tumor cells in blood. Because, you know, when the tumor starts uh, growing, uh, the cells detach very easily because they proliferate and detach very easily. So in some sort, they fall down into the blood. Okay. But since they are not very malignant at the beginning, they die. It's a special suicide called anoikis, mm. you know, because they are detached uh, from the other cells. Sure. They undergo that. So, so we see them. We see big nuclei, tumor-like nuclei, but uh, there is no cytoplasma and, and uh, they are clearly X tumor cells, you know, mm -hmm. or that tumor cells if you want. But if you let the process going on, then you have invading uh, tumor cells. So really very malignant tumor cells generated by the primary tumor mm -hmm. and those cells are capable of detaching from other cells without dying okay. to invade the tissues around and invade the blood, circulating blood without dying. And then they get out from blood and stay in the distant organs as retard bomb. 
And they don't proliferate immediately, but then if you have a decrease in immune defense or inflammation, they can proliferate in, uh, in, a, in an organ, and then the metastasis is created, and the metastasis uh, spread the tumor cells again. So imagine this process, it becomes exponential. It's... Um... It's it's really fascinating, and and I and I'm very interested as you've been, just you know, cap, finally you know be able to capture these cells finally, and and understand every part of the um, metastatic journey. Let's say, are, are you finding out important components of that last step? So you were mentioning they get there, they're in the new tissue, but even then. Uh, you know, a, a, a liver cancer cell doesn't always get, uh, I, I'll put a different, actually different one. My father died of prostate cancer. It went to his spine. Now the prostate's very different than the spine. And it's, things have to happen even after that's, that metastasis where that prostate cancer cell has to, you know, I get along in the spinal cord now. I'm happy here. Are you finding out interesting things about that last step? Because I think that's extremely important too. And I'm just interested in what you're finding as you're analyzing the real details of these cells. Yes, yes. So uh, we don't study these processes uh, directly because we are uh, very much on early cancer diagnosis, sure. I will talk about. But of course, these processes are very uh, interesting to us. And uh, as you pointed out, this aspect is is very uh, impressive. It's called the seed and soil, you know, because you need to find the soil for the right seed. Yep. And uh, um, put it simply, you know, for a tumor cells coming from the prostate, in the example that you uh, brought up, um, to uh, make a colony into the spine, into the bone, is uh, as for us, uh, to build a colony in another planet, in, yeah. in the planet Mars, you know. Right. So um, those cells are becoming so malignant. And so I would say they um, um, deprogram their, uh, their DNA. And uh, so th they become capable of growing in, in uh, other organs. So your question is why a bone? right? And why bone is, uh, first of all, the bone marrow is uh, a, um, an environment uh, which is very much rich of um, growth factors. Sure. And, and so uh, several tumors, not only prostate cancer, um, can uh, grow into the bone marrow. But yes, definitely, there are uh, receptors into the tumor cells which have been found and which target those cells to the bone marrow microenvironment. You know, like lymphocytes, we, mm -hmm. we speak about homing, you know, yep. because they can home in different uh, uh, lymph nodes or different uh, areas in the body. And the tumor cells, uh, they behave in the same manner. Sure. They have uh, molecules which allow them to uh, target uh, specific organs. Now, the point which is uh, very important to, to me is that, uh, you know, 40% uh, of uh, cancer are diagnosed now at the stage of metastatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, uh, we, we generally lose the battle. So that's the point. Yeah. Now, we distinguish uh, uh, now, it's recent, uh, two different types of, uh, of tumor, you know. You have uh, tumors, uh, they develop, they are not so much invasive, they grow. And uh, by growing, first of all, they occupy space and they give symptoms. And uh, after their growth, so when the mass is larger, they become uh, capable of invading, okay? And then you have a second type of cancer where they are capable of invading. So they contain tumor cells capable of uh, invasion of uh, tissues or blood, you know, what I explained before, from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these cancers are those 
who are detected and diagnosed at the stage of metastatic cancer. Because when the cancer is very tiny, in one uh, in a tumor mass of uh, one millimeter of diameter, you have from one to three million of tumor cells. Mm -hmm. And when the cancer is invasive, uh, you know, one millimeter of diameter is, uh, you know, at the limit, very often below the threshold of detection by many imaging uh, mm -hmm. analysis like uh, PET scan, for instance, and other ways or ultrasonography, you know, you, you, it depends, you know, the, the sensitivity of those uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, depends on the type of tumors of the tissue, which is targeted and so on. But anyway, uh, one millimeter is uh, very close to the threshold and very often we cannot go beyond. Now, one millimeter diameter of tumor mass uh, contains already one to three millions of tumor cells. And when mm -hmm. the cancer is invasive, the tumor cells uh, go out uh, into the blood as living cells, not as uh, cells, uh, um, you know, prone to die. Right. And that's very important. So um, at some point we thought, okay, uh, but uh, knowing the biology of those invasive cancer, we thought uh, maybe we can find tumor cells uh, before the tumor mass uh, it becomes visible by imaging. Mm -hmm. And so um, ISET uh, is the really unique technique because there are several publications uh, which have been uh, issued by uh, completely independent researchers who used our system. Mm -hmm. And they reported that they could find tumor cells before the time when the tumor mass became uh, detectable by imaging, you know, uh, up to four years before. Mm. So that's very interesting uh, because now we have a tool, you know, for invading cells or detecting those dying cells that I was mentioning uh, to detect cancer very early. Mm -hmm. And this is really, uh, you know, what we want to pursue um, because, uh, you know, it's uh, um, the problem of cancer is that uh, it's, you know, put it simply, very simply, the problem is that in a single cancer, in a, in a single patient, uh, you have a variety of uh, tumor cells yep. and they are very much heterogeneous. And so when the tumor burden increases in the body, you know, when you are far from the beginning, so you have more tumor cells into the body, those cells are very much heterogeneous. And this is why all the effort, all the billions which have been spent uh, developing uh, new therapies, which are good, but if you apply those therapies at the late stage, then you cannot win cancer because you can kill the majority of cells even with targeted treatment. But then after a few months, after uh, one or two years, you have other cells which were not killed by the drug mm -hmm. and they start proliferating and, and they, and they uh, are responsible for the uh, cancer recurrence and, uh, and the, the patient death. So the only solution to this is to find cancer very early and to, uh, to kill the cancer at that moment with, mm -hmm. with the weapons that we have, because we have surgery, because we have uh, chemo, we have, uh, you know, you know, radiations, uh, uh, all those tools, uh, they fail when we apply them uh, too late, but they are efficient when we apply them um, very early. And the most important is uh, uh, the immune defense, because the immune defense of the body, they can go everywhere and take uh, and, and, and uh, destroy the tumor cells. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, 
one Australian team working with our system, ISET, uh, is um, an integrative medicine center. And so they followed patients uh, and they, they published a small cohort of patients where they found circulating tumor cells and they put the patients uh, under uh, uh, treatments, uh, strategies, you know, uh, to increase the immune defense. Uh, you know, you re-equilibrate the patients, uh, you do, uh, you know, meditation, uh, you uh, vitamin C and, you know, you have uh, several tools. Sure. And they published, they, they observed a decrease and, de and disappearance of those tumor cells. They had published before that they had found tumor cells in blood in patient, and they had put those patients under surveillance through imaging, mm -hmm. and, um, and they finally discovered the tumor mass in those patients. So they had found the tumor cells before. Wow. And this has also been uh, published by a French team. Uh, they, they followed patients uh, with uh, COPD, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, so it's uh, uh, pulmonary disease. And they are at high risk of developing cancer. And they followed those patients uh, for six years with ISET and uh, with the uh, CT scan, low dose CT scan. And in, in five patients, they saw circulating tumor cells in blood that mm -hmm. they continued, you know, doing eyes at, uh, and CT scan. And uh, finally, the tumor mass became evident uh, one to four years after they found circulating tumor cells. So the patients um, had been operated immediately, uh, same for the Australian team. And, uh, and, uh, and now they, they are considered cured because uh, the publication is 2014, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they have a nice follow-up for those patients and they are considered cured, which demonstrates, because there are very few studies, you know, in, in this field. Right. And, this demonstrates also what we know from animal studies mm -hmm. that at the beginning, the tumor cells, they go into blood, but they are not malignant enough uh, to generate a metastasis. Sure. So if you have tumor cells, as soon as you detect the tumor mass, you go with the surgery, you cure the patient. At least is what we have as data. It, it, it's it's really fascinating because it's, it's almost like there's an entirely separate, uh, let's say, cyst domain here, something called pre-oncology, sort of like pre-diabetes. It's, it's not diabetes. It's, in this case, um, as, as you know, our, our joint friend uh, Ezra Raza wrote in, the, in this article in Scientific American about it's starting earlier, finding earlier, the ISET technology it fits perfectly into that. Are there... Um, Tumor types, and I'm just thinking about your experience in liver cancer, where, okay, you, you know certain people have hepatitis or they've had hepatitis or they drink too much, whatever. Um, are there I certain, tell you. yeah, where they sort of this pre-oncology theme uh, of starting, you know, we, we, we know you have this, we need to start now because five years from now, we're going to monitor you, but, but. And, and maybe it's not surgery, radiation, and, and, and low-dose chemotherapy. Maybe it's, as you were saying, uh, inflammation, meditation, vitamin, whatever. What, what are some of the ideas you obviously, you know, not the recommended, but what are some of the things you're thinking of beyond sort of the tools we have today and the smart drugs and sort of being able to stop things you were saying in that microenvironment before we even see those tiny tumors? Um, Take us on a little journey uh, of what you... Yes, uh, yes, that's a really about. fascinating, fascinating field. Uh, yes, so um, it's a new domain of medicine, yeah. you know. And w what we need to, to understand is that uh, a new domain is an open window. And so we have uh, many unanswered questions, sure. right? Um, but... Uh, you know, science go on. And in fact, uh, you know, I, I wrote a book about uh, the impact of uh, and importance of uh, early cancer diagnosis, yep. which was published in, two in 2017 uh, in Europe. Um, that's really uh, the, the direction we have to take. And um, because uh, as uh, Professor Azraraza pointed out, pointed out so 
beautifully, you know, the, the old paradigm mm -hmm. uh, to deal with cancer failed. They, we know they failed. And uh, it, it is an observation for uh, the last hundred years. So uh, we spent billions uh, and we cannot keep on doing the same things again and again because uh, there is no surprise. We will fail again and again. So we need to change the paradigm. And if we target uh, all, uh, the, um, uh, all the forces we have, all the, the resources we have uh, on early cancer diagnosis, uh, we will see that the world cancer will disappear or will not have the same meaning than now. Because now when, when, when you say cancer, uh, people, they think death or high risk of death, you know, because of course there are cancer survivors, yep. uh, but high risk of death. Uh, so it's a deadly um, vision you have. But if you think that you can detect signs of cancer very early, mm -hmm. okay, uh, then you can do something. And your question is, uh, what? What can we do? We have to study, but uh, we, we start to at least imagine what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, decrease inflammation, mm -hmm. uh, reach a better harmony between the soul, the body, you know, uh, a, bet a better rhythm of uh, our day, um, our sleep, uh, how do we live, you know, reduce the stress, which is so important uh, to generate a lack of harmony uh, of the communication between the cells. And, um, and the, on top of that, we have drugs. We can uh, stimulate the immune system. Mm -hmm. And then we have surgery. All those uh, uh, tools that we use to, to fight cancer, we still have to use them, you know, when they are needed, but uh, at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, our vision uh, is that uh, in a few years, if we, you know, uh, change the direction of our target from, as uh, Professor Raza says so beautifully, from the chasing the last self to chasing the first one, mm -hmm. uh, then in, in the next decade, we will have huge successes. We know it because uh, is demonstrated by First of all, but not only by cancer, uh, by other diseases like uh, diabetes, uh, you know, bacterial diseases and so on, uh, all, all kind of diseases. If you uh, start treating or preventing uh, at the earlier step, uh, you can uh, uh, either suppress the disease or, you know, end up in, in, in curing the patient uh, much, uh, much more easily. Uh, and of course, in cancer also, we have the demonstration because uh, uh, with the PAP test, you know, now early detection of uh, cervical cancer, you know, nine out of 10 of those cancer are uh, cured now, thanks to PAP test. Mm -hmm. Mammography, you know, in every uh, single type of cancer when we have been able to detect the cancer earlier, we obtained huge successes. So it will be uh, the same. Excellent, excellent. And just for the audience, uh, Dr. Paolini's book uh, is uh, it's available in French, Portuguese, and Italian uh, in Amazon. Yes. I don't know, pronounce it. Tour, tour, what, what, what does it mean in English? Sorry. Uh, it's the, killing cancer. The title killing is cancer. Okay. Killing Cancer. I, I should know that. Okay. So I just want to, I just want to put that out there for everybody as okay. well. Okay. It will come in English too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Dr. Marley, also uh, one thing, obviously, you know, um, you've uh, had amazing success in, in academia and research. You are an accomplished author. Uh, talk for a couple of minutes on just uh, what it's been like to become now, alongside all of that, an entrepreneur and running your own company. Um, obviously, 
you know, it, it, you're a startup and you have to deal with everything that uh, st- smaller companies have to deal with. But uh, t- take us through a few minutes on, on what that experience yes. has been like for you. Interesting experience. First of all, I want to uh, point out that, uh, you know, I created the company because uh, I could not find in another way money uh, to develop our researches. You know, when we published, uh, we patented, and then we published uh, sure. ISET, uh, the system, uh, we asked uh, the, um, the public agencies, you know, funding uh, research, sure. and they told us, oh, no, no, because uh, this uh, is a domain of uh, uh, p- companies, you know, and so ask big companies, uh, diagnostic companies, okay, we want to see uh, big diagnostic diagnostic companies, they told us, oh, no, 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 this is too early. We cannot put money there. So we left with the only solution, um, which was possible thanks to the innovation law uh, in France uh, um, was issued in 1999 and uh, uh, allowing uh, academic researchers uh, to create a company. Mm -hmm. And uh, the company created in that way has the uh, worldwide exclusive license uh, of of the patents, uh, you know, filed by the researchers uh, and uh, belonging to the university. Uh, So we created the company and I have to say that uh, that's another wall, you know, I oh, just, yeah. you know, the uh, the case of uh, tumor cells being in another planet, uh, this is for a scientist, there's also another planet uh, to be an entrepreneur, you know, uh, completely different, completely different mentality. And uh, I, of course, uh, had the uh, many challenges so the first company was uh, very close to die but i learned so many things and i did my mba you know on the ground (laughs) and finally i i created the second company rare cells and uh, so I used the, the, the teaching from the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to say also that in France, you know, in the United States with the Silicon Valley, this, uh, this paradigm, you know, of having public research, uh, which is uh, used to push, uh, you know, the economy and uh, the growth of companies is quite old. But uh, in France, it was new mm-hmm. at that point. And so, you know, there was no uh, crosstalk between uh, uh, business people and the scientists. You know, the scientists were um, pretty often uh, uh, ejected from the company. You know, it was a strange situation where, you know, there was no trust of uh, the two types of, um, of actors there. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I survived, <laughs> and um, if oh, of course many challenges, you know, uh, being a scientist, entrepreneur, and in France, and being a woman, uh, and uh, you know, willing to develop something uh, which is meant to be important, and um, uh, maybe I can uh, tell uh, you know if there are young people. Uh, listening to to this talk is that you know when you have a dream just uh, okay you have to fight because you have challenges you have obstacles but just don't look at them too much just like if you uh, walked on a tread you know you look in front behind in front of you and you don't look on the right on the left because you will get to your uh, to your destination to your dream and uh, this is really my experience and uh, also i think i, I was very very lucky and uh, and another uh, another thing i would like to to tell young people if you have a dream uh, just uh, let trust life life will uh, uh, do it for you. Just uh, trust what what will happen to you. It's an outstanding message, and it, it's it's so very important, especially in today's world where uh, the younger generation is expecting things to happen like that. But uh, that's not how things work, especially in biotech. And the fact that you are staying with this uh, on both sides, it's just it's it's so fascinating. And I really take my hat off to you and everything you're doing. 
uh, and, and really wishing you the best with all of this. Um, for uh, everybody that's going to be uh, listening to this particular episode on uh, the podcast network or watching on uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Patrizia Pagellini, uh, professor of cell and molecular biology and oncology at Paris Descartes University, uh, head of a research team at the French National Institute of Health Medical Research, founder of Rare Cells Diagnostic, uh, also uh, pick up her books um, on Amazon, Killing Cancer, uh, Dr. Fadley, this has been outstanding, um, listening to your journey and, and, and everything that you've been doing over the years. Um, I want to take time to thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule for coming mm -hmm. on the show. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. As we say here, uh, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow for, for so thank many you. people via your research. It's just been fascinating talking to you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Irene. Congratulations on what you do, because I think you, you really spread the hope and encouragement to many people. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> That's the goal. Great seeing okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.